Hari Sirafan. Welcome to uh, Millionaire Muslim, Islamic Finance Guru's podcast. Thank it's you. an absolute pleasure to um, have you here. You, I, I see you as um, the the kind of figurehead at the the front of this ship called Islamic Finance, where you know you you've been in the industry for so long. Um, I think you're probably one of the few people who who really you know get the full uh, breadth of what's going on. Uh, just you know by sh- by fact of the you know the amount of time that you spent in this industry so I'm quite interested to you know pick your brains and you know get a bit of your insight onto the industry uh, but f- before we do that I wanted to um, find out your story and um, what better place to start than than Oxford uh, so you studied physics there I did yes yeah. uh, how long ago what is that not is that a taboo question uh, yeah it's a long time ago um, between 1993. Um, so I was born in the, the town of Dudley in the West Midlands, oh, okay, um, cool. which is um, one of those places that unfortunately time forgot. Um, I think actually it had the highest proportion of voters for leave in the referendum. Really? Um, so it really is, a, you know, kind of a, a very interesting place to come from. Yeah, yeah. And I think by the time I hit the age of 18, I was just desperate to get out and see the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, so I think doing physics at Oxford was kind of my ticket to doing that. And I, I had dreams of... I guess sitting in an observatory in Palo Alto looking at the stars as a physicist. But I realized once I got to Oxford that there were just too many extremely brainy people then I'd never be able to compete with them. Um, so I kind of set my sights a little bit low and decided to go into the city. Right. Um, and I, it started with a management consultancy at the time, Anderson Consulting, which is now called Accenture. Oh, yeah. This was sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, the poster child of recruitment in those days, and it was really interesting, supposedly a very interesting place to be. Hmm. I actually got a bit bored after a couple of years because I got sent to lots of uh, grim towns doing data entry into spreadsheets and not really learning a great deal. And after yeah. a couple of years, um, I discovered something called project finance, um, which is uh, the financing of infrastructure. Uh, roads, railways, bridges, schools, hospitals, that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, actually, that's... That's finance with a social conscience. I think I could do mm. that. Um, and I managed to find my way into a, a small British merchant bank called Hambro's, um, which was a very traditional... Is this the same that rolled into ha- that Hambro Perks? No, I, I, th- I think that, ha- that might be a family connection thing. somewhere, right. but Hambro's was one of the old school British merchant banks, which eventually got taken in by Société Générale. Um, and I, I did project finance there, obviously conventional finance, and always felt a little bit uncomfortable about the whole riba thing because mm. I figured, well, this is this is finance with a social conscience, and yes, you know, we're doing things like financing bridges and schools and railways and so on, but it's still using riba. So what's the alternative? And I investigated a bit with Islamic finance. Um, I happened to move across the Deutsche Bank in the late nineties, and. Um, was in their London office and about uh, two or three years of that later they said can you move to Dubai and this is all project finance this is all project finance we need a guy to sit in Dubai and open a new office there yeah and I was sort of junior to middle ranking investment banker at the time Um, and my remit would be widened I'd get to do you know broader corporate finance mandates and originate business for for the region from Dubai which was fantastic for a, a youngster I was sort of I guess uh hadn't quite turned 30 by that point um so moved out to Dubai when I arrived, um, the Dubai International Financial Center was just being mooted by the government and we ended up being their first advisor, their investment nice. banking advisor. So there I was, one of the very first entrants into the DIFC, um, you know, pretty junior and had very senior access all of a sudden. Yeah. And we also found at the same time that a lot of clients were coming to us and saying, it's great that you're here, Deutsche Bank. but..." Can you do these deals on a Sharia compliant basis? Now we've never done that before, but you know, being investment bankers, we blagged our way in and said, "Sure, we know how to do that." Um, and we happened to work with a scholar called Sheikh Hussein Hamid Hassan, who was really, mashallah, one of the most phenomenal individuals I've ever worked with. Um, super mind, uh, very dynamic and able, uh, creatively thinking. I think he'd been used to working with people who weren't quite as cutting edge and sophisticated in the past right. and all of a sudden you have these young Deutsche bankers asking him how do we do this and how do we do that and do you think we could use this kind of contractual structure in FIP to do this kind of thing yeah. and he'd never really been asked these sort of questions before and he enjoyed that interplay yeah, yeah. so we were respectful but we weren't overly deferential as his mm. previous business relationships had been and I think that was a very healthy relationship. So we found the Deutsche Bank team was just starting to innovate in Islamic finance in a way that had never been done before. 
and we were creating the kind of acquisition sukuk, convertible sukuk, you know, um, exchangeables uh, with and without rights attached to them. We had a, a hedging platform, a derivatives and structured investment products platform that had never been built before. It was absolutely unique stuff. And all of a sudden we had 100% market share in all these new areas. So then management in London obviously started pricking up their ears and saying, oh, what's going on in Dubai? These guys are just kind of minting money or what? Yeah. What are they doing? And, you know, we had people flying down and checking us out and, you know, success has many fathers and, yeah. you know, their success got spread around the firm and that's, that's normal and natural, but it was a great time. A great time for us, great time for me personally. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, it's all part of the design of Allah. And, you know, we ended up um, creating products that essentially uh, created an exponential boom in the Islamic finance industry that had never been seen before. And um, boom is accompanied by bust. Um, and we also had been busy creating these structured investment products, which were intended to be used for creating things like hedging platforms. Um, how does a company that buys materials in euros and sells products in dollars hedge yeah. itself against currency volatility? That's a perfectly halal thing to do and it can be done in a halal way. Unfortunately, the same techniques that we were using to do that were also techniques that we could that could be used to buy, say, a credit default swap on Greek sovereign de debt default. What, that, what does that mean? Uh, CDS, credit default swap, is like an insurance policy. So you can take an insurance policy on your neighbor's house burning down. Now, I wouldn't want somebody else to have, but it's illegal. You can't take your policy on your insurance uh, on your neighbor's house right, burning yeah. down because you could be an arsonist and you might make money out of that. But of course, in the financial services industry, you can do that. You can take a CDS on Greek sovereign debt, even though you might not have any exposure to Greece in any way whatsoever. And yet this technique that we'd invented Hmm. could allow bankers to do exactly that. And is this in just the Sharia compliance space? Because presumably the, the tech existed to do that anyway in the conventional space. Right? Correct, yeah. So, so the conventional industry, you saw what happened in the global financial crisis and you probably heard of things like CDO cubed, which are collateralized debt obligations and they're, they're like a, a, an onion, you peel away the layers and you keep peeling, you keep peeling, you're wondering where this onion <laughs> finishes. Um, and these financial products had so diverged from the real economy, there was really very little relationship between the pieces of paper that people were trading on financial exchanges and the underlying real economy. And of course, the, the key to Islamic finance, it's not about interest. Yeah. People say, what is Islamic finance? Oh, it's about not having interest. Well, no, actually, Islamic finance is about mm. the nature of money. Yeah. What is money? Money is, a, is not a commodity to be traded, which mm. is what happens in the modern financial services industry. You can't trade debt. Yeah. You can't trade bonds uh, because you're trading money at, above mm. or below its yeah, par value. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's about the nature of money. Money needs to be a, a medium of exchange only, uh, a unit of uh, account, uh, yeah. a storage of value. That's what money is meant to be. Yeah. And many of our classical scholars have commented in detail on this point. But Islamic bankers are, have forgotten that and don't actually understand that point in general. I've met very few Islamic bankers mm. who've stopped to reflect on what is the nature of money. They just carry on replicating the same conventional yeah, debt yeah, that yeah. they've been brought up on and replicating it in a Sharia, we're using Sharia compliant oh, contracts. Gods, yeah. yeah. So the letter of the law is being followed, but is the spirit of the law being followed? I'm not so mm. sure. So there we were creating these really funky products um, and, um, and then the global financial crisis happened. Uh, and a lot of the big investment banks, um, by that stage I'd moved to Barclays, um, where I was a global head for Islamic finance um, for what was then called Barclays Capital, Barclays Corporate and Barclays Wealth. Um, and um, at that point the big banks decided that they would retrench to what they knew best, because they had to devote a lot of compliance and legal uh, infrastructure and resource to fixing their, their problems within those institutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, things like Islamic finance was a luxury they just couldn't afford even though it's commercially very successful. And that industry uh, then sort of the, the, the baton passed back to the Islamic banks, um, who, you know, it's been relatively uh, uninventive in the last 10 years or so. Interesting. Uh, not a great deal has progressed yeah. since then. Um, and I, I happen to think that's because, um, you know, there are some fundamental issues that the Islamic banks need to solve in order to recapture hearts and minds of their target demographic. What, what do you think those are? Well, I mean, I think they've been very good at the hype. Um, 
I think that uh, in some cases it's justified. Uh, when you look at the UK, for example, which is you know, where I'm from and where I live and where I work, uh, the UK government has done a fantastic job on legislation, on regulation, um, and actually it is very attractive to the rest of the world. The whole world trades Sukuk, whose documents are governed by English law, because yeah. it's robust yeah, and yeah. well precedented. Um, the whole world will come to the London, London Stock Exchange to list their Sukuk. Uh, the whole world will do arbitration here. Um, the UK is a fantastic place for Islamic finance to flourish, but the Islamic banks, and specifically the ones in the UK, I think, are have kind of lost their way. Um, and they've, as I say, they've lost the hearts and minds of their target demographic. So if you are a retail home buyer who wants a Sharia compliant mortgage, you really only have one option in this country. Mm. Um, and you used to have more, but the big banks moved away. Um, that means that those individuals are not well served by the industry mm. and they also don't feel that what they're getting is a, is a truly, at least they feel mm. they don't, they're not getting a truly ethical product, mm. but one that's sufficiently differentiated from conventional finance yeah. to convince them that they ought to pay a premium for this. And by yeah. the way, I don't think they should pay a premium at all anyway, yeah. but there is a premium and that's a function of the size of Islamic banks and their rental why, risk. Why do you fund. think there should be a premium? Why should we pay more just because we're, we are um, uh, trying to uh, meet our religious obligations? Mm. And there's no reason in reality why. The, the reason why Islamic finance products, like home financing products in the UK are more expensive is because Islamic banks are smaller, mm. they have a higher cost of funding, they're considered to be more risky in the yeah. market with their counterparties, and therefore they, that higher cost of internal funding is reflected in the price of the products. There's a flip side to that, of course, which is never mentioned, which is if you deposit your money within the Islamic Bank in the UK, you're actually earning a greater rate of return. Right. Yeah. But people forget that flip side because they're negatively biased. Yeah. Right. Um, so why why do you think that we should? Is this, is this? Do you mean that aspirationally we shouldn't have to pay a premium, whereas right now, given the market dynamics, yeah, we're having to pay the premium, and that's understandable. My boss at Deutsche Bank said, "I want to create the Islamic Big Mac." I had no idea what he was talking about. When <laughs> right. He said that he said, "I want to create the Islamic Big Mac." I want you to go out and create product that looks and feels exactly the same as conventional products. The same performance, the same quality. Mm. Okay, you may think that McDonald's is not a great quality, but it's a consistent quality yeah, wherever yeah, you go yeah. in the world. And he wanted to create a product that was consistent in quality for all customers throughout the world. And they mm. wouldn't feel that they were paying more for it or getting a worse performance just because it was Sharia compliant. So that was the objective of Deutsche Bank when it started out in the early 2000s yeah. in this space. And that's what I think Islamic finance is missing, because since those big banks have retrenched, mm. Islamic finance hasn't really found <clears throat> that leading institution that says, I am going to create a product that you will, it will be a no-brainer. If you're a Muslim, mm. it will be a no-brainer. Right now, I mean, I, I come from a conservative background. My friends and family are all practicing Muslims. Uh, you know, 90% of my social circle is, is practicing Muslim. And yet very few of them have an Islamic bank account. Yeah. No. But why is that? Because riba is one of the most heinous sins in our faith. Mm -hmm. One of the most heinous. I mean, it's on the level of shirk and murder. Yeah, yeah. And yet, we don't talk about that. We talk about halal food and praying on a Friday at the mosque. Mm. Uh, you know, relatively, those are less important issues mm. than riba, which yeah. is a, a cancer on society, mm. which has created massive inequality in 2019. Mm. Supposedly, when we're supposed to be you know, advanced and civilized, uh, you know, uh, nations on earth, but we have huge economic problems, and riba is the reason for it. And yet, most Muslims in my social circle will say, "Yeah, yeah I looked at an Islamic bank. It didn't feel very Islamic. It didn't look very ethical. It was very much more expensive. Why do I want to?" You know, mm. blah blah blah. And I kind of sympathize because you know they um, they feel that they should be getting a, a unique, u uniquely differentiated product spiritually, it should feel ethical as well. And they're not getting that. Mm. Um, and also they shouldn't have to pay more. I think it's the paying more that's a problem for them. Yeah. Muslims can be their own worst enemy. I mean, uh, there was an experiment a few years ago uh, in the Northwest of England to create a risk sharing home financing product. So of course a lot of Muslims will say, well, you know, if it looks and feels exactly like a conventional mortgage and the rent it just looks like interest, then I can't see how that's any different and I, I yeah. don't accept it. They're wrong, of course, by the way. The majority of scholars will, will mm. say, actually, it's, the, the contractual form is very important. 
because the risks are in, in fact slightly different. But I understand why they say that. But when you say, when you give them the alternative and say, okay, I'm going to give you a true risk sharing mortgage, right? You want to buy a house, I've got a pool of investors. You finance the house and they'll partly finance the house, just as you do with a normal mortgage mm. and just as you do with an Islamic mortgage, which charges you rent. But this time, if, the, if you sell the house and the value of the house has gone up, they will share some of that upside. Mm. If you sell the house and the value of the house has gone down, they will share some yeah. of the downside. Yeah. That's an equal you know, transaction on both sides. And presumably they don't pay, like that. You pay market rate rent yeah. as well, yes. which they definitely don't yeah. like. They don't like that. Oh no, they don't have to pay market rate rent. They, oh, can, right. they can pay a, a rent that is benchmarked to other Fine. banks. Okay. You know, benchmarked LIBOR, which is the interest rate. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you tell them they're going to share in the upside and they are, they're not interested at all. Oh no, I don't want that for yeah. sharing. No, 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 that's too halal for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I need to have, you know, something. It is, I mean, I agree with you. I think there's almost this, um, you know, I want my cake and I want and to eat it. eat it. Right. And, and <laughs> so in a way, they're their own worst enemy because they want to yeah. complain a lot. But when you give them the, the true risk sharing real economy option, they say, well, yeah. I'm not sure I like that very much. So there's a compromise. And right now in the industry, we are working on various ways that we can appease Muslims spiritually, yeah. economically, uh, and contractually. Uh, and that's kind of the the real uh, uh, you know the, the, the real objective. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, Harris, that that's really helpful. I, I just wanted you to talk and you know give that kind of color. Um, I mean, where do you think you know you've said that over the last ten years the Islamic finance industry has kind of you know just been stagnant or it's not really done very much. Where do you think is like the next? Do you, do you think that these banks they retrenched because um, because they needed to you know put assets or put their focus on their core you know business um, and it was uh, un- it was profitable to do Islamic finance for everyone yeah. so like you know HSBC Lloyd's they they retrenched as well and they pulled out. Do you think it was profitable for them as well? It, it was. was just that they just wanted to focus Very on their profitable. core stuff. Very profitable for them. Um, just prior to HSBC shutting down the Amana brand in every single country in the world except for two, which is Malaysia and Saudi Arabia, they had announced their profitability for HSBC Amana. It was fantastic. Their CEO had made a statement. And yet, just a few months later, they shut down that brand. Mm. Um, around the world, big banks were doing the same thing with the Islamic mm. uh, divisions and Islamic windows, as they call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they were using, um, I guess, the commercial angle, commercial viability as their excuse, but the numbers were telling a very different story. Mm. Islamic finance was very profitable for them. The problem was that it was a little bit alien and mysterious mm. to their senior management. So just before Barclays decided that they would no longer do uh, Islamic finance, um, the then CEO, uh, Bob Diamond, visited us in the region. Um, and the CEO of the Middle East introduced Bob Diamond to me and he said, Harris, I want you to tell uh, Bob about you know, Islamic finance and how important it is strategically to the region and what they're yeah, doing yeah, and so yeah. on. And for the entire conversation, this only lasted two minutes. So he walked into my office. And we spoke and he held his blackberry in front of him and as i'm talking to him as the distance you and i are now yeah. it went like this uh-huh uh-huh he just wasn't interested yeah. i mean it was just yeah. zero interest to him they had i mean every organization needs a champion mm. at a senior level to push something through the uk government mm. had say the varsi as their champion to push through the UK sovereign Sukuk. Mm, mm. You know, you needed to have somebody like that to make sure that it happened. Um, and in an investment bank, you need somebody very high level. At Deutsche Bank, we had a guy called Yassin Bohara, who, who we nicknamed the Godfather of the Middle East. And he had, he was a member of the Exco, which is the executive committee of the bank itself. Um, very, very senior guy. And he said, you got to go and create the Islamic Big Mac for mm. me. Yeah. Um, and I'm waiting. And that's fantastic. You've got somebody at a very senior level who says, I'm going to give you all the, all the authority and the resources you need to make it happen. And we did make it happen at Deutsche mm. Bank. But when you have a guy who's completely disinterested and then yeah. six months later is hit by a massive LIBOR scandal, yeah, yeah. you know that a, a type of financing, an alternative financing based on ethics is not really the highest priority. Yeah. Um, and they had other issues on their mind compliance and legal and regulatory. Do you think that they, these guys will make a comeback in the industry? I mean, it just seems like uh, when you show, show them the money, they'll do anything. Mm. Um, I think it'll be a shame because yeah. you know, they've shown themselves to blow hot and cold. Yeah. Um, whereas individuals in the industry mm. have stuck to it. 
Mm. They said, I, I won't be involved in the business of riba. Mm, yeah. I want to do something that's good for not just Muslims, but for humanity. Yeah. And I believe Islamic finance done the right way is good for humanity. Mm. It's, people for, it's good for people of all faiths and no faith. Mm. Uh, they don't have to be Muslim. Yeah. We don't have to use Arabic words. We don't have to use the word Sharia. This is an alternative ethical financing model. Mm. Um, and if we apply it the right way, then it has huge applications. And right now, I don't think the Islamic banks really see those applications. Yeah. So where do you think is the innovation going to come from now, where we are today? And where do you think it you know, is best to come from? Because it sounds like you're saying it should come from within these Islamic banks. Or well, I, I mean, I, as I'm watching something very interesting happening at the grassroots at the moment, um, I'm uh, quite heavily involved in Islamic fintech these days. Yeah. And um, I see non-bank financial intermediaries are making great strides, but they don't have the money and they don't have the backing. Um, and you know, at the grassroots, um, people are saying, well, I've seen what the Islamic banks do. I've seen what the conventional banks do. I've seen what the Islamic banks do. I'm not entirely happy. I, there's a problem out there. We need to create this kind of product or that kind of product. And I want to go ahead and create it. And it's youngsters coming through with computer science degrees, uh, hmm. systems development backgrounds, uh, and the traditional management and finance and economics and marketing uh, backgrounds. Yeah coming together and saying, you know, we can create these teams now to create, for example, a digital Islamic challenger bank. Mm. Now, nobody's yet created a really successful version of that. Mm. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm close to a, a couple of efforts to see that uh, happen. And, um, you know, these are things I think that will really change the game because in the same way that Deutsche Bank changed the game for Islamic finance in the early 2000s mm. by creating products that have never been created before and creating a huge spike in uh, Islamic finance in those early years. Um, I think that is due to happen uh, soon when the right kind of funding comes through for grassroots Islamic fintechs mm -hmm. who are trying to solve problems to do with home financing, yeah. Uh, yeah. to do with you know robo advisory, to do with um, uh, you know retail deposits, um, electronic money, cryptocurrency. You know there are some really incredibly interesting projects happening right now, but they need backing. Mm. And the difficulty that this industry has is that if you were a traditional, I say traditional, if you were a conventional yeah. fintech, you go to Silicon Valley, yeah. right? People get it, they're sophisticated, they understand how to invest in these things, how to evaluate them. Uh, your average Islamic investor, particularly from the Gulf, is not that savvy with you know uh, modern tech and fintech. Um, and if you go to the Middle East, Gulf money, I'll try net worths. They're used to buying bricks and mortar, you know, real estate in London. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. if they're slightly more sophisticated, they'll buy, you know, warehouses uh, uh, of blue chip companies in the Golden Triangle in, in you know, Leicester or somewhere like that. Right. They a 7% yield and they kind of understand that. But again, that's bricks and mortar. Yeah. Show them anything beyond that, pure private equity, pure venture capital, tech investments. It's a bit more of a struggle. Mm. So who is there out there who will understand the sophistication required to invest in tech which is also Sharia compliant, which is a huge, huge demographic, which is currently completely unserved. 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, many of them underbanked, uh, many of them lack access to inclusive financial services. And the opportunity is enormous. I mean, here, even in, in the UK, uh, up to 3 million Muslims, not hugely uh, bought into the idea of banking with Al Rayyan. I am, by the way. I'm, yeah, I'm a yeah. supporter of Al Rayyan. I believe they've been doing a very good job. I was very sorry to see Sultan Chaudhry go. I think he was an excellent yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, but you know they're struggling, and they've got their own internal issues to deal with. They've got to deal. They've got to act and behave in front of a conventional regulator yeah. who is very supportive. Mm. The UK is a supportive environment, but an Islamic bank in a conventional framework is still a difficult thing it's to achieve. Yeah. And that's why I'm a strong, strong believer in creating a tech-based digital Islamic, Islamic mm. challenger bank solution. Mm. Um, and I think it's time has come. And um, are I, there are there any people we should be watching out for going forward uh, you know, at the stage to say yeah or not? There's there's a, a, a couple under wraps at the moment, so I, I couldn't name anything at this stage. Um, but you know, to be quite honest, uh, funding is really a difficulty, mm. and these things will not become successful unless a sophisticated investor steps up and is prepared. Mm. And uh, my fear is that, that sophisticated investor might end up becoming a large conventional investment bank. And mm. when that happens, 
it will take away the uh, spirit so of the with, endeavor. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and it's really important that we maintain the spirit of that endeavor because through the accelerator that, that I run, we see a lot of um, grassroots fledgling companies, startups with uh, really noble ideals who want to solve a problem, mm. and they're collecting the right people to solve that problem. Um, and as long as they maintain a tight knit group, they will maintain the solidarity and the spirit mm. of the endeavor. But I think as soon as they start to expand that out to large conventional mm -hmm. ribbon based organizations, they will lose that spirit. Yeah, and exactly. you will see spoilage in the same way that we saw spoilage of the Islamic finance industry yeah. after Deutsche Bank had pr produced this all singing, all dancing derivative structured investment products yeah. platform, which I, mm -hmm. I dubbed the Manhattan Project. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Manhattan Project uh, during the Second World War, the Allied scientists assembled in Los Alamos to create the atomic bomb before right, Hitler did. Yeah. And you know, the technology that they were discovering could be used for good or for bad. Mm. And it's used more often for bad. I mean, mm. you know, uh, or at least it's, it is, it, it's, it's, it's intended yeah. you know, in that way. And that is, um, that's why I dubbed the uh, derivatives product project at yeah. Deutsche, the Manhattan Project, because we were creating something to be used for a good purpose, but <clears throat> we knew that it could be misused and it was misused mm. by the industry generally. Mm. And that's my fear is the moment that the big conventional banks take over. And even the Islamic banks, I mean, I, I fear that Islamic, the shareholders and the board of directors of the Islamic banks too often appoint individuals who are of a certain type. Mm. Um, you know, the silver from fox a conventional from a conventional background, background yeah. uh, who really doesn't understand the technicalities of the products yeah. that their people are creating. He doesn't understand the demographic of the people that they're serving. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. understand the industry networks, doesn't have the industry networks, doesn't know how the scholars work, uh, how they operate, what the mm. process is. It's no surprise that certainly in the UK, you know, the Islamic banks have been declining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Profitability has been going down. But they keep repeating the same mistakes. Mm. They keep taking on the same tired old management who are there to you know, put uh, you know, Band-Aid yeah. the cuts yeah. um, and it's kind of the definition of madness isn't it it's to, yeah. to do the same thing over and over again with the expectation of a different result but it doesn't yeah. happen so Harris um, I mean you were talking about the accelerators and I know there's a few things that you're currently involved in um, I mean, what are the things that you're currently involved in and um, it would be great to understand you know what keeps you busy day to day I wear two hats now so um, I was a sober banker until a couple of years ago <clears throat> and um, the one hat I, hear, I wear is a, as a consultant um, I'm a partner in a professional services firm called Gateway. Yeah. Uh, Gateway is the only uh, professional services firm that operates in the Islamic economy, solely in the Islamic economy. Um, so we have uh, 55 consultants in 22 countries uh, and our clients are financial institutions, um, uh, corporates, um, organizations that are creating funds uh, that are working in the Islamic economy, the digital economy, the halal economy. Um, and uh, whilst at Gateway, I uh, formed uh, with a couple of guys a panel called the UK Islamic FinTech Panel. And the idea was to bring um, uh, industry players in the Islamic FinTech industry together to collect entrepreneurs and investors into one place where yep. they can interact, formalize um, uh, our interactions with the UK government to help them to uh, clear policy hurdles which is why we're very pleased to have uh, three government departments on board as observers, uh, Bank of England, HM Treasury, and the Department for International Trade. Nice. And uh, this allows us to connect the industry together and allow it to flourish. Mm. So <clears throat> this was a, a, an independent venture, uh, which is you know, um, partly assisted by Gateway. Gateway. Out of the UK Islamic FinTech panel, we are creating commercially deliverable projects like IE5, IE5 is our accelerator. So we're attracting Islamic economy companies to the accelerator. About half of them will be Sharia compliant fintechs. The other half will be general Islamic economy companies, most of them digital economy. Um, so for example, we have um, halal cosmetics, halal travel, halal education, um, mm. as well as Islamic fintechs, uh, like an insurance, an online insurance product, for example. Um, and um, uh, you know, at the grassroots level, it's been very successful. Uh, we're bringing these companies together, we're helping them to find funding, uh, and, and that's really where these things start that's from. Fantastic. Um, and so what, what happens in this accelerator? Is it, do, do they, um, is it an accelerator where do, do you pay to get in or do you, I mean, how, how does it work? Do you get 
do you get committed funds as part of the accelerator or is a value add something else? Yeah. So there are three levels to the accelerator. You join either as a, as a free registered entrepreneur and you're there to interact with a global community. So we hope that we will have people from Indonesia and Malaysia talking to people from the US. Um, a community not just of, of entrepreneurs but also investors mm. and professional advisors. Um, that's the first stage. And they'll have access to online things like webinars and master classes mm. and so on. The second stage is a, a relatively uh, low cost um, uh, basic service for startups and entrepreneurs, individuals, um, to get them. Uh, many of the people that I speak to on a daily basis mm. are young and bright and dynamic and have great ideas and great mm. energy, but have never really spent enough time in the business world to know how to start a company, how to have how to negotiate supplier agreements, mm. how to have an NDA in place with somebody, how to protect their intellectual property, mm. <clears throat> how to negotiate a lease agreement, um, how to register their product, uh, how to set up an SPV, mm. how to attract investors, how to write a business plan. These are all mm. really basic things, but many of them just haven't been through that process before. Yeah. And <clears throat> IE5 has a number of relationships uh, with partner firms. Gateway is one of those partner firms. And Gateway has, you know, very high quality magic circle lawyers, uh, bulge bracket investment bankers, big four consultants, mm. very, very senior levels who can provide that advice on a very, very cheap mm. basis um, as part of their membership fee. Um, so that's the second level. The third level is for companies that are at a more sophisticated and advanced stage. They are typically around Series A funding. So they've been in operation for a while and they already be profitable. Uh, they have a company already in place, they have a, a team already in place, and they might be looking for the next stage of fundraising. Hmm. Um, you know, that's something that is more sophisticated. And again, this is where our professional partners like Gateway come in uh, because, you know, they, are, they have access to those senior level industry contacts and, and indeed can help with product structuring yeah. and contract yeah. negotiation and so on on a bespoke level. Makes sense, yeah. and uh, and so that's uh, so one one hat is the consultancy uh, advisory type hat. Yeah. What what was the other hat? I didn't quite so know. the other hat is entrepreneur. I mean, okay, I, cool. through IE five, which is you know, I'm, I'm almost like a, a co entrepreneur with the with the members who come in, but also my own company called Over Capital is an investor in um, Ilmspired. Ilmspired is okay. my wife's company, um, uh, which is a, a an Islamic education app. Um, so she is a, a qualified teacher uh, and she was, uh, when we were in Dubai, she was um, the only non, or rather the first non-Arab to be certified by the Ministry of Religious Affairs to be an Islamic education teacher in the UAE. Uh, and she essentially created a brand new syllabus for the British uh, school that she taught at. Um, and it was a syllabus that many people, many other schools looked to and said, wow, what are you guys doing that's got so much attention mm. and how can we replicate that? So taking all that knowledge and experience and 20 years that she's had doing that kind of thing, um, she decided she'd create a mobile app and a tablet app um, to digitize her syllabus, her mm. curriculum and her ideas to create an interactive Islamic education website, which was based around games. So, you know, when kids nowadays are sitting around with their mobile phones and their computers and they're playing Minecraft and God knows what else, um, <clears throat> you'd wish as a parent that in fact they would be playing a game in which they might actually learn something. Yeah, yeah. So she created an interactive uh, website where there would be 65 games covering the entire Sunday education syllabus for ages 5 to 11 years old. Nice. But through the form of games, you know, memory games and matching cards and snakes and ladders and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that way, parents could feel that, you know what, I can let them have the mobile phone for an hour, let them play on it if they're playing this game. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's the usual earning rewards and you know, yeah. trophies and whatever. Um, so that was a, a digital economy Islamic app, perfectly suited to an Islamic economy accelerator, like yeah, IE5. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're there to offer advice and guidance and, and, and professional relationships. Um, but she's the entrepreneur. You know, she's the person who's she's the creative brains behind right, yeah, that, of um, and you know that's that's how the accelerator works. That's the kind of service that we provide. Interesting, um, Harris. I'm uh, aware of the time, so I wanted to get you to uh, your book recommendations, um, uh, especially for people who are um, you know maybe fairly junior, just starting out post university, yeah, or or not, you know. Yeah. 
Um, so what, what book recommendations would you have for our audience? You know, I got, I got a call uh, a couple of weeks back from a really bright 17-year-old uh, who's down at um, Royal Grammar School in Guildford. And out of the blue, he just happened to find out that I lived in the same hometown as him. Um, and uh, he approached me and he said, I, I want to know more about this. I'm writing my dissertation on the subject of the Islamic economy. Um, so I, I essentially threw about 10 books at him right. and said, these are the books that you need to read in order to get a grasp of the issues. Because a lot of people think, oh, Islamic finance, I need to get myself a textbook on Islamic finance, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, and that's perfectly fine, something recommended by mm. you know, the FT or whatever. Um, but, you know, these are dense, uh, difficult books to read. Um, frankly, you don't want to read something with structured diagrams and so on. And that's, you're not really going to learn a great mm. deal. You want to know what is the... What is the philosophy behind the Islamic economy? Mm. What is the nature of money? Why do we think money in a, think of mm. money in a different way to a conventional banker? So I think actually in some senses it's really good to read uh, alternative economists um, and on anthropologists. And the one anthropologist I would recommend to everybody is David Graeber, who is a, a I guess a self-styled anarchist, uh, which sounds kind of odd coming from a banker, <laughs> um, but a really good read. Read Debt, the First 5,000 Years. Yeah. Uh, it's a great summary of the human history of debt and money from the perspective of an anthropologist, yeah. not an economist. Because I am not a big fan of economists. I think, honestly, the way economy, uh, economics is, is taught in schools and universities is, is out of line with reality. It has mm. almost no basis in reality. And we've seen that with the global financial crisis in yeah. 07, 08. So read an anthropologist like David Graeber. Um, he's also the guy that started the Occupy Wall Street movement. Even mm, odder that a banker would be recommending yeah. a guy like that, but really good read. Um, read Yanis Varoufakis, who yeah. was the uh, economics professor, I think, at Exeter University and then became the Greek finance minister. Yeah. Um, a great book to read is, it's got a red cover and it's called uh, something like How to Explain Economics to Your, or how, how to Explain Economics to Your Daughter. Something like that. Explaining economics to your daughter or something like that. And I literally bought Varifakis. that book by Yanis Varoufakis. Okay. I literally bought that book in order to explain economics to my daughter. Huh. Um, so the title is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, great book, really good read. Um, particularly, I liked his definition of the difference between exchange value and experiential value. Exchange value measures GDP. Experiential value is not reflected within GDP. I'll leave that thought with, with listeners because they yeah. can go away and read that book and understand the difference and understand why GDP is such a poor value of the measure of human progress. Mm. Because it doesn't, it doesn't measure environmental mm. progress. It doesn't measure human happiness. It doesn't measure the divorce rate, the literacy rate, how mm. happy people are. Yeah. Yeah. And we miss that in modern economy. Um, try other alternative economists like Steve Keen, uh, who is an economist, I think, at Kingston University. Um, more general books uh, on uh, finance and business. People like Michael Lewis, very, very readable. Michael Lewis wrote The Big Short. You might have seen the movie The Big Short. Yeah. A great explanation of why the global financial crisis happened in very easy to understand terms. You don't need to know anything about finance. Yeah. Uh, you need to know very little about business and management. But that's a great book for the layman to understand why the world went wrong in 07, 08. Um, Mervyn King, the former governor oh, yeah. of the Bank of England, um, now that he's no longer governor, he can be, I guess, a bit more truthful yeah. about the so social usefulness of global finance. Yeah. And like Lord Adair Turner, who was the former head of the FSA, uh, believes that some aspects of banking, many aspects of modern banking are socially useless. Mm. Um, try Gillian Tett, the Financial Times journalist. Uh, she wrote a book called Fool's Gold, a very good summary of um, you know, global finance and the problems you have with modern derivatives and sim similar uh, financial transactions. Um, I've recently read a book by Seyfuddin Amus called The Bitcoin Standard, uh, so named because it's similar to the gold standard. I am a strong, strong believer in uh, decentralized uh, cryptocurrency because I think that fiat currency, which is currency that is decreed to be legal tender yeah. by governments, such as the US dollar mm. or the euro or pound sterling, are in fact uh, detrimental to human progress. And I think uh, if you look at 5,000 years of human history, as an anthropologist like David Graeber has done, will tell you that whenever there have been periods that the world has used gold mm. as a currency, there have been long periods of stability, of economic progress, of peace, of technological advancement, of scientific advancement, of literature, of arts, of culture, 
And then when you move away from the gold standard, or when, for example, emperors like Nero start mm. clipping the gold coin, so they take a gram off the gold coin and they start devaluing the wages of, of workers, mm. that's when you have an inevitable spiral into decline. And over the course of the 20th century, we have seen a decline in the real value of the US dollar of 96%, wow. which is astonishing. And we don't think about that because when mm. we calculate our end of year returns for HMRC and submit our tax return, we don't think how much my, has my currency or my wealth actually devalued because mm. of inflation. Mm. We don't see that as a taxation on us, but it yeah. is, it's a tax on us. Yeah. Whereas when you have a sound currency, a currency that's immutable, that's decentralized, yeah. that's not regulated by one government, mm. you actually have a very stable basis for human advancement and prosperity and peace. Right now we're seeing a polarization of the world we're seeing uh, trade barriers being erected. When trade barriers start going up, other sorts of barriers start going up as well. And when that happens, civilizations stop talking to each other. And when civilizations stop talking to each other, they start warring with each other. Hmm. So this is an inevitable decline, which we must stop. And the way to stop it, I believe, is through a sound currency. And that's why I happen to think Bitcoin is a fantastic idea. Mm. Maybe things like the execution need to change. Maybe mm. there'll be a, a 2.0 version of it. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah. think that uh, it's actually a fabulous, fabulous idea. And I, in many ways, this uh, uh, currency, which was created by this mythical figure called Satoshi Nakamoto, yeah. it could be a group of people, it could be one person, we don't know. But in many ways, we assume that they're non-Muslim. In many ways, it's the most Islamic form of currency I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah. So I think we as, as Muslims should actually take a step back and think, wow, that's really about the real economy. Mm. That's really about human progress and advancement. It's really about peace and harmony mm. and tolerance and understanding of each other. That's, there's nothing more Islamic yeah, than that, yeah, yeah. right? And yet I think many governments around the world are trying to tell us, oh, there's something very wrong with this. Mm. You stick with the US dollar, you'll be absolutely fine. That, that's the, the world's reserve currency and you need to follow that. But I think that's very dangerous when we start thinking mm. and accepting received wisdom, which is why I don't, I don't follow what conventional economists are telling me. Harry Sirfan, it's been uh, a pleasure. I think that book list is going to keep us all busy for a while. Um, and I think it's uh, it's been very informative for myself, I'm sure, but also I'm sure for our, for our audiences as well, because you've I think you've come at things from a um, from a slightly different perspective, which is always helpful to you know get the old uh, grey matter turning. Uh, so Jazakallah Khairan for making the time and uh, I look forward to having you in, in the coming in the coming podcast inshallah. Thank you, Ibrahim. Great to see you. Salaam alaikum.